Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's My Macula and Me. My name is Cathy Elf and I'm the Chief Executive of the Macula Society uh, and um, uh, we have as usual on tonight's webinar a, um, an, an illustrious panel of very special guests. Now you'll know that the guests on uh, these webinars are always experts. They are experts in their field. And we always say that the experts, the real experts in macular disease are the people who have it. And our three panelists tonight all have a form of macular disease. And we're going to be hearing about their, their personal experiences, about how they were diagnosed and how they have um, come to live with their macular disease. And I hope that by sharing their stories and in fact sharing perhaps some of your stories as well, uh, we will all learn a lot more about macular disease um, and, and how to live with it uh, in a well and fulfilling, fulfilling way. So my three guests are uh, Pat McGill, who is in Lincoln. We have Kate Healings, who is in Swansea, and Louise Plunkett, who is in Norwich. And we're going to hear all of their stories in a minute. We're going to get straight onto it. Don't forget, questions. Your questions are very welcome. Please put them in the chat function, and we will come to as many as we possibly can in the course of our hour together. So welcome and thank you all for joining us. And Pat, Pat McGeo in Lincoln, tell me about your story. How, how did you discover that you had macular disease? It's a complicated route, wasn't it, for you? It was a very complicated route. Good evening, everybody. Um, about 21 years ago, I was driving and I thought, and maybe it's time I had some spectacles because I thought my sight was deteriorating slightly. So I made an appointment to see an optician. The optician kept having a look in my right eye and said, there's something just not right here. I'll refer you to your doctor, which uh, the optician did. My doctor then referred me to a specialist, an eye specialist at the hospital. And I saw this consultant. And uh, when I went in, he says, oh, he says, you've got AMD, um, you're a bit young to have AMD. However, he says, you'll eventually go blind and there's nothing we can do for you. And I thought, I, I thought, what? And that was it, he kicked me out. And I left there devastated. I thought my world had fallen apart. I had a round trip of 50 miles to drive to work. There was no public transport to get me there. I still had a mortgage. I communicated with people by email and letter and the likes. I had a lot of friends around the world as I served in the forces for 30 odd years. And basically I thought, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do that? How am I gonna pay my mortgage? You know, I, I just, I was totally devastated. And I didn't, never heard of what AMD was. I had no idea. And of course, he was right at that time. There was nothing they could do because there was no um, treatment for, for macular degeneration at those times. It was before injections for wet macular degeneration. So I was in a right state. I came home and I said to my wife, I'm going to go blind. What am I going to do? I've got AMD. And she says, what's AMD? I said, I have no idea. So she went on the internet, on Google, did a search and found the Macular Society. So I telephoned the Macular Society and I was told, you should never have been told that. You'll never completely go blind. You'll gradually lose your sight. You'll always have peripheral vision. And through uh, talking to someone at the Macular Society, I can't remember who it was at the time, they did say to me, it worked out that I had probably dry macular degeneration. So they give me lots of information. I joined the Macular Society straight away and I kept getting more and more information. I thought if I'm gonna go blind, I'm gonna be stubborn, I'm gonna beat this. I'm gonna try and set myself up with all the knowledge and information I can. And I did loads of research, um, found out as much as I could about it. And eventually when I retired some 14 years ago, the Macler Society were doing a course. I went on a course of a skills for seeing or a century viewing as it was called then. They then did another course of gadget guide. So I did that course and that gave me loads more insight. 
and I learned as much as I could about it. About six, five to six years ago, I had to go for a cataract pre-assessment with a consultant to have a cataract removed. And I said, oh, I've got AMD in that eye. And he had a look and he says, no, you haven't. That's not AMD. It's a slight scarring from a childhood illness, probably measles or something like that. But it's definitely not AMD. And I thought, there's me 14 years getting myself prepared for when my eye condition got worse. However, about, ironically, about two years later, I did develop AMD or dry macula in my left eye. So I do have macular degeneration now. But that was my story. I was, you know, I was given no information whatsoever. And I don't think things are much better now. Now, that's, that must have been an absolute roller coaster of emotions for, for you, really. I mean, you spent, you spent 14 years thinking that you had a condition that at that time you didn't actually have. Um, yes. Did it make you feel ang angry or upset or, I mean, let alone having to deal with the diagnosis and then to find out that actually you had, you'd worried for 14 years, maybe, unnecessarily? It, no, it didn't, actually because I'd done so much research and learned so much about the condition. And I thought the Macular Society had helped me so much. I thought it's now my time to put effort back into them and help people who may be diagnosed. I knew what it was all about. <laughs> I'd be prepared myself for 14 years for things to get worse. And, you know, I, I knew as much as I could really. Um, from research and, and courses I've been on and one thing then another. And I thought it's now my time to help people. And, and indeed we have and we'll come back, we'll come back to some of the marvelous things that you that you do for us. And thank you very much indeed. Not least of course I should have introduced you as a trustee of the Macular Society as well. So many things. Kate, can I come to you? Tell me your story. How how did you um, get your diagnosis and was it any better than that? Well, I was actually 52. I'd uh, been to Florida with the family and I'd gone to take a photograph and I couldn't see anything and didn't think anything and just passed the camera on to somebody else. Then a couple of months later, I went for an eye test and she did my right eye, which I could see. Then she went to do my left eye and I couldn't even see the board. So she was walking around the, the room with handbags and colours for me to try. And she didn't seem as though she knew a lot about it. She was a young optician. Anyway, she sent a letter to my GP and I then went privately to uh, my consultant. And um, he was one of the old school. You didn't uh, speak unless you were spoken to. And I went to see him and he did drops and everything. And I always remember it was just before Christmas. And then I came back into the room and he, he said, I hate my job. So I thought, my goodness, what's he talking about? So eventually I said to him, are you trying to tell me I'm going blind? And he said, yes, you've got macular degeneration. Your left eye is completely gone. I hadn't even noticed anything. My right eye, he told me I'd got it in my right eye then as well. Um, I then uh, kept going to see him, but there was nothing out there. I had fluorescein angiograms and everything you could have. And I was sent away. And then I went back to the hospital probably three times. And they sent me away every time. In the meantime, I got a friend who worked for Novartis. And they were working on Lucentis. And she was keeping me informed about all the results with Lucentis. So I knew that was the drug for me. Um, I then went back to the hospital and my consultant said, um, would you like a second opinion? So I said, oh, yes, please. I've never been offered that before. So I was sent up to Moorfields and I used to go to Moorfields every six weeks and see Adnan Tufel. And um, then they were in the process of releasing Lucentis off-label and he said, I can get it for you, but you would be going to Harley Street and we don't know what the side effects are going to be. So eventually he got me in touch with, um, oh gosh, her name's gone now, in Bristol. 
Um, oh, it's gone. Um, Andrea Gordon. Claire Bailey. Claire Bailey. Claire Bailey. Claire. Yeah, Claire Bailey in Bristol, who was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I used to go there and pay um, every six weeks again. And then she wrote, because it wasn't having any effect. And she wrote then to Mr. Edishaw in Swansea, who then disregarded the letter because he thought I was still going to Bristol. So I then contacted him and he said, oh, six months later, um, oh, I thought you were still going to Claire Bailey. So I hadn't done anything. And then when it was released um, to the National Health, I had it the very same night um, on the National Health. And now I'm probably on my 70th injection in my right eye. It's amazing, I, isn't it? It has yeah, made such I, a difference to so many people, that drug. I could have done with it two years before it was available. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would have been much better. And of course, now it's fantastic. You can go to an optician on a Wednesday and by the following week, you have an injection, which is well, catching people earlier. It is, it is, and that's so crucial, isn't it? We know yes, that the earlier yes, people yes. are treated, we know that now, after 15 mm -hmm. years of experience with drugs like uh, Lucentis, we know that people oh, are treated and early. I did, their I vision I'm trying to, um, uh, Mr. Pickering, the consultant, said to me that first day, joined the Macular Society, and that's what it did. So 25 years ago, this was. Marvellous, marvellous. Yeah, so well, that was very yeah. good. Very good. Um, and yeah. Louise, now you have a completely different story to tell, don't you? And much yeah. of your life when you were affected by macular disease, even though actually both Pat and, um, uh, and Kate were uh, affected relatively early, actually earlier than most people. But you were a child. Yes, I was. Good evening, Kathy. Thank you for inviting me on. So I, I'm an only child and I had always been a bookworm from a very young age and would always devour books but I would always read them held very very close to my face so my parents would like pull the book away and like you know you need to need to be sitting and reading it from further away and I would pull it closer again because I couldn't see it there but obviously not knowing any different so this kind of continued all through school um would go to the opticians regularly as you do there was nothing there you know I didn't need glasses they were like you know it's just one of those things go with it but it wasn't until I hit my teenage years, so early teens, probably about 13, 14, I was at high school and I was struggling to see things on the board at school. Um, back in those days in the 1990s, we had things such as overhead projectors, um, which are an archaic thing now. But there was one particular day I did a maths test and it was all on the overhead projector. And when it was parents evening, I had maths teacher reported back that I had a very low score and it turned out that I had missed an entire chunk of the maths test off now I didn't realize that I had because I didn't see it on the board so there ensued a very long ping pong affair between my optician who could see that there was something not quite right in my eyes but not know what it was and the pediatric eye consultant at my local hospital and I can remember my optician would say, your eyes remind me that of an older person looking into the eyes of somebody much older, but you know, you're only young, so this, this doesn't make sense. And the pediatric eye consultant would say, hmm, you're a bit of an enigma. I'm not quite sure what's going on here, um, but we'll see you in six months time. So this continued for a couple of years. Um, and it wasn't until my parents got quite firm with him shall we say that they asked if there was anything else that could be done any further tests and he was just like well there is but they're not very nice and do you really want to put your daughter through that I'm an only child um, and it was very much implied that my parents had all their eggs in one basket and were being slightly neurotic so he eventually agreed for me to have these tests done it was electrodiagnostic tests I can remember sitting in a stuffy little records room at the hospital, which they rigged up as a makeshift testing booth for me and having all the lights shone in my eyes. And then just before Christmas in 1994, the consultant rang my mum and he said, um, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry to say this, but you were right. There's something wrong with your daughter's eyes. Um, she's going blind, but we can't do anything. Um, but we'll see her in clinic in January. Have a lovely Christmas. 
and put the phone down. Now, back in the 90s, the internet was only just in its infancy. So we literally had a couple of computers at school where you could Google stuff. And, you know, Google back then wasn't anything like it is now. So we were left completely in the dark, having had that bombshell hit. Um, and then when I went to see a different consultant in the January, he would only just recently finished all of his training and his internship at Moorfields and had come up to my local hospital. He was the only one qualified to actually interpret the results. And he was just as brusque. He was very young um, compared to the other consultants. And he was like, well, you can't drive a train. You can't fly a plane. Your sight is already deteriorated too much. You, you'll never drive a car. I'm registering you as partially sighted. Um, you'll be registered blind pretty soon because it'll deteriorate further. I don't need to see you anymore. Off you go and get on with your life. And that was it. So these experiences are very um, uh, similar, aren't they, in terms of the, yeah. the shattering nature of the diagnosis and the lack of empathy, which I think everybody in a way feels that they were that they were shown oh, yes. at the time. And, and although in your, in your case, at least 30, 30 years ago, the fact is we hear this every day on our advice and information service, and it's very frustrating that actually this still happens. So um, the common, sto common stories, it must have been exhausting and, and shattering, as I say, for you. So we've got some yeah. questions coming in now all, already, and we'll come to those in a second. But just to go go round, round again, um, m maybe um, I, I think m m one of the critical questions I think that people have at this is, is that where, where do you go? What's, what are the first kind of um, responses to a, to a diagnosis? And we've got a couple of people who've just been diagnosed on the on the on the call now have just come into the chat um how, how do you cope with that what do you what do you sort of what goes through what's going through your mind what are your what were your kind of survival mechanisms so pat we heard from you that your survival mechanism was information to learn more about about what you what you were doing louise what was your what was your so first instinctive you were much younger of course did you realize yeah i was i was much younger so I was I was 15, so I just started my two years study for GCSEs. And I think for me, looking back, it was relief, actually, that something had finally been pinpointed. We now had a reason why I was now sitting at the teacher's desk at the front of the classroom, because if I sat any further back, I couldn't read what was on the board. But yet, you know, everyone would say, oh, go and get some glasses. I go to the opticians, but I had no prescription need there. And people just couldn't get their head around that. So I think for me, it was relief. For my parents, it was sheer panic and terror. Um, I can remember asking, we, we sought a second opinion because it had taken so long to get that diagnosis. It was, you know, have they actually got it right after all this time? So we went down to Moorfields, um, saw Professor Bird, absolute amazing gentleman. So, so good. And, you know, he, he confirmed it is what it is. Um, but had far more empathy, time, patience to explain things. Um, and so has Professor Webster, who has taken over from him now in the genetics clinic. But I think it, it's just finding out what you can, but it is going through that whole process of kind of shock, disbelief, anger, rage, frustration, sadness, you grieve. But it's very much a cyclical process and it can take quite some time to go through those cycles and to to get to a place where you then feel comfortable with it and it's taken me a long time to get to that that place um, I wouldn't say I've been in denial but it I having sight loss was never something that I spoke out about you know I wouldn't didn't like to make a fuss I was a teenager you just wanted to fit in with everybody else and be like everybody else be normal in air quotes so for me, I kind of hid it. Um, and then obviously going into my 20s, I met my now husband. Um, we got married, we had a baby. And it's then the whole saga of going to baby groups when you can't actually see other people. And then when they become toddlers and you go to the park and they, they run, I'm just like, where have they gone? So mm -hmm. there's, there's so many different challenges that you face, but there's always ways around it. And I think the, the, the important thing to remember is that, yes, having a sight loss diagnosis is devastating and it does change your life. 
but it's not the end of your life. There is so much you can do. You can you just have to pivot and change direction and think about things differently and focus on what you can still achieve rather than what you're not able to anymore. Great tip. Kate, um, what about you? What was your instinctive survival mechanism? Um, well, I took... Um, Mr. Pickering's advice and joined the Macula Society. And I did find that once we'd started a group, it was started as a WAM group at first, and there was really nobody in Swansea who was of that age, it was working age members. So I started to run it and changed it to anyone can join. Um, and I find we learn from each other because you're there, <laughs> I can remember going to an optician and saying, I want to buy some dots to put on things so I could tell which button was to switch on and off. Um, I didn't say that um, when I first went, my consultant told me I had the eyes of a 70 year old and I was 52. Um, but then I, I got these dots and he said, well, what do you want for? You don't just buy them. You have a low vision assessment. So nobody had mentioned about having low vision assessments. And um, that then puts you on the path of getting magnifiers, which obviously help tremendously, and good lighting and things like that. And when people come to our groups, we all give each other tips on what we find helps us. Um, Yes, it's, it's a shock and you think what um, the biggest thing is you can't drive. So your independence goes. And I used to drive all over the country. Um, but yes, and I gave up my job. And it was funny because my second eye, I had a gallbladder operation and I knew within a couple of days, my right eye had started to go. So I went to the GP and I said, I know my right eye is going. And he said, oh, that couldn't be anything to do with the operation. But I said to him, but the only problem is I've been privately, so I'm on nobody's list. So it was then that I really started to go to the hospital occasionally, but of course all the time they were, you were turned away. And as I say, the first day was um, uh, Mr. Edishaw doing them at seven o'clock at night injections. And it's been ongoing for the last gosh, ever since you could get them on the National Health yeah. and before. 20 years, so that's uh, 15 years, isn't it? Very nearly now. So, Pat, yeah. I know the, that the other know. thing I did, I started yeah. to take vitamins because he told me to take, this was Mr Pickering, zinc, selenium and all these things. So I found a uh, drug then that had all these in. And for years, I used to take them. So my second eye, both my eyes are wet, my second eye didn't start to deteriorate until after this gallbladder operation at 60. So I had eight years where I had got one eye, which you can still drive and everything. But um, you feel as if you're doing something. Even if it doesn't work, you feel that you're trying to do something. I think that's a really important thing, this sort of effect, this fending off this sense of powerlessness, isn't it? And you can, when, you, when you're doing something, you're learning, or you're doing something with taking vitamins, evidence is, is inc in, in, inconclusive, isn't it, about it. Mm -hmm. But actually taking back control, it's taking back control to a certain extent, isn't it? So Pat, I know that, I mean, the other thing that you have done, as, in, as indeed our other guests tonight have done, is throw yourself into helping other people. And as, as Kate says, you know, learning and talking to other people about this is such a, we call it peer support, don't we? And, and, and mm -hmm. we try to encourage, um, people to benefit from this through our group network. So we have a physical meeting face to face, increasingly uh, with uh, sort of obviously in abeyance during COVID, but now getting mm -hmm. back uh, to meeting face to face to face and sharing those hints and, and tips. And, and Pat, I know that you, you as uh, as a as a the group leader in in Lincoln um, has been, you know, you get referred people refer to you all the time, don't you? What are the kind of things that come up again and again? With the people you speak to about their concerns would you say? Most of the people that get referred to me um, they, they haven't been given any information it's a lack of information lack of support and um, 
I got myself fairly well known in the Lincoln area because I made a nuisance of myself. I went to the hospital and said, you're not given any information here. If someone is diagnosed with AMD or macular degeneration of any sort, refer them to me and I will talk them through it. I went to the opticians, the same sort of thing. So I'm well known in the Lincoln area and other blind societies and people are referred to me. The group I run, when people come, it's amazing. I get them to talk about how they've overcome things and share what they've done. And other people will say, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's a great idea and so on and so forth. So sharing of ideas and talking to people who have the condition, because not everybody is the same. People do things in different ways, but someone will have something you haven't thought about. And it's usually a really good idea. And it's something to share. And the sharing of your issues, your problems, don't sit there and think, oh, I've got macular degeneration. I'm going to lose my sight or my sight is gone. I can't see this. I can't see that. Talk to other people with the same condition and find out how they've coped with it and how they are coping with it. And it's amazing what you can find out. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, I've done so many th different courses. I've researched so many things. Um, I am able to give people loads of information, signpost them to various help agencies and the likes, um, and tell them. They don't get told that uh, dry macula can turn to wet. They haven't even been given an ampsular grid to check if there are any great changes in, in the site. And, um, you know, they don't get told anything. And it hasn't changed over the 20 odd years I've been involved. I think if, if anything, it may have even got worse. So people need to be told, need help. It might be just in my area, it's like this, but I have spoken to people in other areas and some areas are worse than others, obviously, but people need to share and be able to talk to someone with the condition and be told all about it. Charles Bonnet syndrome, everything else, they don't know anything about it. I mean, I have some very funny and some horrible stories about people who have Charles Bonnet syndrome or have suffered with Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, maybe you don't hear about them now, but I mean, there's some very amusing ones and some horrible ones. And people are not aware about it. And they're frightened to tell their family in case they think they're demented and will lock them up <laughs> you know so it's, it's Pavel just to explain that Charles Bonnet syndrome is a um uh, a side effect of sight loss not just macular disease but any any kind of sight loss and it yeah. can happen to anybody where um uh the the uh, the brain has a an unusual response to the uh loss of vision and it can create in the visual cortex at the back of the brain these uh, random patterns and they're sort of effectively silent, they're always silent hallucinations and people can see the most extraordinary things, can't they? So many people can see grids like crossword puzzles or fencing and that kind of thing. But um, many people can see these really realistic, very florid um, hallucinations of, of uh, great complex machinery or animals. And it, it's quite, a, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. And of course, as you quite rightly say, if people don't know about this and then start hallucinating, of course, they, 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 they're terrified about what might be happening to their mind as well as to their sight. So it is very important that people know that this is a normal response of the brain, normal response of the brain to the uh, loss of vision. And it isn't a brain disease. You haven't got dementia or you haven't, you know, you're not going, not, not losing your mind as well as your sight. It's a, it's a normal response of the brain, but it is very frightening. Um, I don't know, Kate, Kate uh, Louise, have you well, ever- actually, I had a phone call only yesterday from a lady who um, had been told not to go to the Caribbean because the, the light is too bright. And um, she'd got a family member who was there so I said, yes, you go to the Caribbean, you get good eye cover and a hat all the time. And then she went on to say, and I have people coming towards me and their body from their waist up has disappeared. So I said to her, well, it sounds like you're, you've got Charles Bonnet syndrome and you're not going mad. It's just your brain trying to make sense 
of, of what you're seeing really. And people have been to my group and they've said, there's a lady sitting in front of me and there's nobody there. Then other people have seen rats. And, you know, it's, um, it is, I've had a, a couple of times and normally if you change a chair to a different position or turn a light on and off or blink a few times, you know, and just reassure people that no, you're, it's just a result of, of the condition that you've got rather than going mad. And it is, it is frightening. It is, it is, it mm. is. It can, can be very frightening. Some people enjoy them. They find them very interesting and, uh, and, and enjoy them, but some people do not. And it is important to say that not everybody has this. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not an inevitability. But it is as well to to know know what it is if you do if you do get it it's very it can be very uh, a bit alarming to say to say mm -hmm. the least. So um, let's get on to some of these points now that people are, ra are raising on the on the chat here. So we have so, so, um, so, somebody here who is, uh, is is interested in sport, and of course this is one of those um, pastimes: you know, sport, reading, music, reading, um, driving. All these things, it, it can be very um, upsetting to lose those things that have been such big parts of, of your life. So this is somebody who I think is is in or from ca Canada and wants to play tennis. Yes, now, I, I used to play tennis. So and how did you cope? Well, you have a ball with bells on. And um, yes, it's, um, you know, the ball is on you before you realise but yes, um, I used to play tennis before I lost my sight. And then I went to the um, visually impaired tennis that there might be around him or her. And I also, the thing that I do, I line dance. And that's the thing I can still do. Um, and what I do is I stand next to somebody with big feet and I follow <laughs> their feet. <laughs> because I can't see the teacher, what she's doing. But you stand next to somebody and you just follow what they're doing. If you go wrong, so what? It doesn't matter. It's exercise, isn't it? Very interestingly, we have a, another a trustee um, who is a world champion tennis player uh, oh, in, okay. in VI tennis. And he wins again and again and again. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, it's it's you play slightly differently. You get the double bounce, and the ball is bigger, and it's yellow, and it's got mm -hmm. got a bell in it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but he still thoroughly enjoys his tennis, and his, yeah. his vision is quite poor, but he absolutely uh, adores his tennis, and he's, he's indeed a world champion. So um, don't whatever you do, give up your tennis. There are other ways of doing it. Another mm -hmm. one, another question here about um, <laughs> taxes and Uber dri Uber drivers. So somebody who was charged a waiting time because uh, they didn't see the taxi driver on the other side of the road and couldn't read the... So how, how do you, if you order taxis, what, how do you guard against that kind of problem? Anybody got any hints and tips on that? I guess I suppose you let them know that you're visually impaired and they will have to come to you, won't they, if you're not going to be able to see them. Is that... Pat, have you come across this as a... Or Louise, I haven't have come, come across, across this, this, but what, what, what I have come across is um, people are not aware that uh, if they are out in the street and they come to a level crossing, and a lot of people are not aware of this, if you come to a level crossing, the pedestrian crossing, sorry, and uh, you can't see whether it's green or, or red or whatever, and, and it's not an uh, 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 audible one, um, some people have, have hearing loss as well. Where you press the button, there is a, a spindle mm. underneath about the size of your finger. And if you catch hold of the spindle with your hand, as soon as you're clear to cross, the spindle will rotate. There are not many people know this, but it is to let you know that you can cross. You're safe to cross. The spindle rotates. Try it next time you're at a pedestrian crossing. And, and, and the other thing is I found where the pavement changes and you're coming to a crossing, it could be a gap to let something into a, a, a car park or even a pedestrian crossing. The pavement changes. The, 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 there is bump-ons on, 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 uh, on, on the stone and the pavement, and it's used. they usually change to sandy or grey colour. Um, but you can feel them through your feet, and you know you're coming to somewhere that's going to be dangerous, that you need to watch out. There are loads and loads of tips and, and loads of things. And I mean, I haven't 
I haven't come anything to do with the taxi side of things, but, but uh, I suppose you must tell them you need to come and get me because I can't see you. So, you know, but there are loads of things out there that people are not aware of that can help them if they're out and about. Yeah. OK, that's really helpful. Um, do, do you know if all pedestrian lights have rotating spindles? No, they don't. They don't. No, they don't. No, no, no. And it's always wise to, if you do come to a pedestrian crossing which has got the rotating cone underneath, press the button and then just give the cone a little twist just to make sure it is free moving. Um, mm. Sometimes some people like to stick them together with chewing gum or super glue and they then exactly. don't rotate, which thank God is issues. I think that in terms of the person asking about Ubers and taxis, um, my advice would be that if you're being collected from home, normally you would receive a call or a text to say that the taxi has arrived that makes it easier if you're from home but if you're catching it from somewhere else and you've booked it for a specific time then I would always say I've got a visual impairment you'll just need to be a little bit more patient with me it may take me longer yeah but okay. I, you know I think, obviously I so appreciate what? you know some people aren't yet comfortable to then say this is what I need mm. you know it, it can take time I, to I get there it can take time, can't it? And quite quite often, uh, we talk a lot uh, about the use of symbol canes. And um, mm. you know, a, this is a short white cane. It's not a cane for navigating. It's a symbol cane to alert people to the fact that you have a uh, a visual impairment. We all we also have badges that you can get on our website saying mm. I, I have a visual impairment. And people have quite strong views about this. Some people think that's really helpful, and it, and it opens doors and people are, are really helpful as, in response to seeing this. And other people feel stigmatized by this or even vulnerable, actually, mm. uh, sometimes. So it, it does depend on on how where, where, where people are psychologically over some of this, doesn't it, I think, Louise? Do you think? Yes, that? very much so. So I had symbol cane training when I was 15 and I used it for a couple of years, absolutely hated using it, just felt as though everybody was looking at me, is that why is that young person using a symbol cane, they don't look blind, and all of the other kind of opinions that could go along with it. So because I felt vulnerable at times as well, um, it went away in the cupboard and it didn't come out for a long, long time. Not until my children, well, <laughs> my eldest is nearly 17 and my youngest is almost 11. Probably not until about four or five years ago. Um, I had managed, I'd found tips and techniques that were subtle, but that worked for me to help me work out how tall steps were, how big the drop on the curb was. But I was beginning to walk into lampposts, bump into people, trip up steps, trip down steps. And... I just had to have a word with myself to say, look, stop being so stubborn. You've got something in the cupboard that can help you. Stop being so proud, get it out and use it. So I got it out of the cupboard and luckily I could remember the training that I'd received. So I used it around my house and I very quickly discovered that, yes, it was great, but I my sight had significantly deteriorated more. So I needed something longer. So I went down the whole route of having a guide cane, which is a bit longer it has a different type of tip on it. So you can use it on the ground to roll it and kind of determine where the edges of curves and things are. Um, and I attended a Living Well with Sight Loss course run by the RNIB. Sorry, <laughs> Macular Society. No, um, great course, there, great there was, course. Great course. I absolutely. Great. And, you know, I'd lived with sight loss for 20 years and I thought, Do you know what, I don't think I'll learn anything. And I learned so much, actually. Lots of little tips but that have made a big difference. So there was a lady that came to talk to us from the local mobility and rehabilitation team. And I said to her, I said, there's sometimes I think that I could do with a long cane. And I had in my head that if I went down the long cane route, that there was no going back. And she was like, no, 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 you can use whatever feels appropriate for the circumstance. So the issues I was having was taking my son to school on a winter's morning. The sun was really low. The pavement was damp from overnight dew. And the glare was horrendous. And literally it was like walking with into blackness. I couldn't see anything at all. So I applied um, to go on the list for long cane training. Um, I got to the top of the list as COVID hit. So obviously nothing happened for a good few months. I then had my long cane training um, in 2019 in August. 
and Michael Kane has been my best friend and I don't leave the house without him he's absolutely amazing but it took me a long time to get over that in my own head um, and now I ju I'm just you know there's no stopping me I walk with confidence and people are super helpful because they you know it's it's a visual cue to them i mean sometimes i do get the most random questions asked of me um quite often i'll get asked if i'm measuring my steps or measuring distance and i have to explain actually no it's a long white cane i'm visually impaired and then the person's mortified but it's educating people and if people don't ask they're never going to know that's very true that's very true it's a very really helpful way of looking at it thank you very much indeed um so somebody um is asking about cvi and re registration so it's been men mentioned a couple of times registered a sight impaired and severely sight impaired um uh kate do you are, are you are, have you got a registration a cvi certificate yes i'm registered blind and have been for a long time but what i find is that doctors see people with macula every day and it doesn't enter their head oh, we should register these people. I always say to everybody I talk to, ask the question, should you be registered sight impaired or severely sight impaired? Because um, my consultant, I had to bring the question up and he said, oh yes, I should have done that years ago. You know. Yeah. So it just to explain then for the, for, for, for the people new to this whole, whole thing, um, there is, it's a two part system, isn't it? So, yes, it is. Um, if, so the first stage is to be is to get a certificate of visual impairment, which can only be issued in England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland by a um, by a consultant or ophthalmologist or an ophthalmologist. In in Wales, I think they are doing in fact a pilot to see whether AMD can be certified by uh, an op optician, and that would be very much better because we get very more many more people through the, the process. So the first stage is to get this um, certificate of visual impairment, which, which is basically a, a formal document that says you have an irreversible um, vision loss that cannot be corrected with spectacles or contact lenses. And it's of a certain level of severity. And there are two levels of this severity, sight impaired and severely sight impaired, what used to be called partially sighted and blind. And yeah. then once that certification has been made, it goes off to your local authority and the local authority will register you as a visually impaired person. And that often opens the doors to all kinds of benefits, doesn't it? Yes. Um, you can get um, a cheaper television license, you can get access yeah. to a blue badge, all kinds of... Uh, all kinds. That, that's only if you're registered blind. Yeah. It isn't um, a low vision. It's got to be severely sight impaired to, get, yes. to access yeah. those things. Yeah. 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 But, but I think you can get a low I vision. Didn't do, I didn't go into the low vision. I'd missed that. I went, it, it was just blind when I did it, but now it's sight impaired or severely sight impaired. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, severely think, sight impaired is blind. Do you encourage people, Pat? Do you find lots of people are getting missing out on this, on this, um, this potential benefit to them? Yes, I, I, I do um, tell them about it. And, and those that are not sure, I, send them back to the either the optician or to get them back to the hospital to get themselves registered and i if there is someone i feel should be registered i have a very good work and relationship with the eye clinic liaison officer at, at the local hospital mm -hmm. and when i speak to her she can bring it up with the consultant and then put the paperwork she will put the paperwork through for either to be registered sight impaired or severely sight impaired. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, like you said, if you're se severely sight impaired, there are a number of benefits you can have. You don't, not so much with sight impaired, but it's a start uh, on the way there. Uh, and going back as well, Cathy, to wearing something or showing that you have a sight loss. I have put on, um, I am visually impaired badge and gone into my bank. And as soon as I walked through the door, I was taken to the front of the queue and I got in front of everyone else. I was in and out in two minutes, <laughs> but I had all my business done. So there are benefits of, you know, letting people know. It's the same if you go into a supermarket and you say you, you, you can put a short white cane across your trolley, shopping trolley, 
and people will see that you may need help and the staff will help you in most cases. So I would say to people, don't be frightened about it. It's, you know, it, if you need help, you need help and get as much help as you can. Good tip. Now, um, Eclos Eye Clinic Liaison Officers, um, uh, many clinics, not all many clinics have them. And um, it, if, if where they do have an, an eye clinic liaison officer, they're very useful people to get to speak to. So if you, if you if you haven't seen an eye clinic liaison officer and you'd like to ask if you uh, if you if, if there is one if there isn't you can call our, our helpline I'll give the number out in a minute and it's the same with the certificate of visual impairment if you haven't been offered one but you think your sight is very visual ask about it and if you're not currently being seen at an eye clinic then you can go to an optician or your GP and ask to be referred back into the eye clinic because you think that you should be uh, be able to discuss uh, certification as a vision impaired person so uh, it, it, the onus is a little bit won't always come to you you probably will have to um uh make sure that you can you can ask i'm going to give you our advice line our helpline number now in case you've got a pen but i will repeat it later so if you want any more information about cvis or i can as an officers and somebody has asked how do you find out about your local group well uh, all those questions can be answered by our helpline and that number is 0300 30 30 111 0300 30 30 111 I will repeat that uh, a bit later on just to make sure everybody's gonna got a pen handy so um uh, somebody has asked about it um Kate you mentioned that you were having injections for your wet a AMD um mm -hmm. and there are now one or two macular conditions wet AMD macular disease that arises as a result of high myopia short-sightedness um, which are all treated in the same way, diabetic macular disease in the same way. But mm. of course, Pat has dry AMD uh, and many people have conditions, genetic conditions um, for which there are no treatments yet at all. Now, somebody has asked about whether there is an injection for dry AMD. And um, a, a month or so ago, uh, we, we did in fact do a session on a drug which is coming now, we hope. It's already in the US. We have a, um, a participant from the US who, um, who, where of course that, this drug is already available. It's called Cyfovre, uh, and it is an injection for dry AMD. Uh, uh, it's delivered in the same way as the wet AMD injections. And we are now hoping that it will shortly be available in the UK as well, but it's not yet, I'm afraid. It's not just yet available. Mm -hmm. um, so um, another issue that has come up um, uh, frequently, I think, uh, about, uh, and in fact, actually, this person in the US says that their experience of, of diagnosis was no better than, than yours. So I'm afraid it's a problem with consultants all over the place. So we'll, we we'll have to work much harder, I think, at uh, uh, encouraging consultants and other eye care professionals to understand the impact of the diagnosis that they're giving to they're giving to people. What um, uh, there are many people have talked about the ARID supplements, and uh, we know that the evidence is a bit. Uh, equivocal over whether the supplements work or, or, or not. Um, you were saying, Kate, you take supplements. Uh, Louise, um, uh, Pat, do either of you take supplements? I've been taking supplements from day one. I've taken gluten uh, in various forms and, and read a lot about it. And I thought, well, it's not going to do me any harm and it may help me. Uh, so that was my attitude to it. I'll try anything that, that may or will help. Belt and braces, I guess, really. Yes, about yes. So I don't take any supplements at all. Uh, my condition is genetic, so there is no treatment. There's nothing out there that will help. Um, the advice that I have always been given is to eat a good, balanced, healthy diet, lots of leafy green veg, and not to overdo vitamin A. So don't kind of overdose on things that are high in vitamin A, like sweet potatoes, carrots, that type of thing. There are some people out there that kind of say you shouldn't eat anything with vitamin A at all, but actually that can then cause other issues, other health issues, um, kind of deficiency in vitamin A and rickets and all that type of thing. So as long as it's healthy and balanced, everything in moderation, um, what you don't want to do is get so hung up and kind of almost fixated on what you are consuming um, because it may or may not have that impact um, on how quickly 
or how far your eye condition is going to deteriorate. So everything in moderation and enjoy life. Yeah, and that's a great, great advice. I think we know now, don't we, that what's good for our hearts is also good for our eyes uh, and eating the rainbow and lots of you know healthy fruit and veg is, you know, it, it's, the, it's the way to go. Now, here is a, here is a question from somebody who uh, only has uh, routine optician follow-ups. The hospital said they didn't need a follow-up should they have a regular checks with the consultant? So it's very difficult to answer that question because I don't know what, what condition that you, you've got. Um, but routine optician appointments are incredibly important. That's certainly something I think yes. everybody I have, uh, yeah. I have found, sorry, um, I have found some people have been told that uh, there's, everything is, is, you don't need a follow-up. We, we'll see you again in six months. And when you actually find out what's actually happened is they've been having injections and things have stabilized they don't realize that they thought that that's it the site has gone totally uh, and they don't actually they haven't actually been told that things have stabilized and that seeing them again in, in three or six months or whatever will see whether the site is still stable uh, People are not told enough. They're not given enough information. That is the main issue I find. People are not given enough information. Yeah, I think that's that's the common theme throughout all these questions, isn't it, really? So uh, we don't know whether you need regular checks with the consultant, but you do need to have regular checks with uh, opticians. Everybody needs to do that because mm. even if you have a macular disease, you may still benefit from glasses on top of all, all of that. Louise, yeah, something absolutely. About? Yeah, no, I was going to say you, you still need to have regular checks with your optician because there still can be a need for a prescription there. And also just because you've got macular disease, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be things like cataracts or other yeah. eye diseases happening. So you do need to get them checked out. However, if you feel that your eye condition has deteriorated, it is always worth going back to your GP and asking to be referred back to the eye clinic to be checked by the consultants. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, GP or, or, or optician. Can I just so say, we're, Kathy? We're, please do. In, yeah. in Wales, it's slightly different now. You can have two eye checks a year if you've got macula. And now it's more or less optician led. So what happens is you go to an optician, he then sends you, it's in Swansea, it's Specsavers who've picked up the contract and they then send you to Specsavers where you, they do the same as they would at the hospital and they then decide if you need to go and have an injection and they've got a time scale so you've only got, um, they've got 48 hours to respond to the optician you've seen and I went and this is why I was back on the treadmill um, I went to my optician and he said, oh, I think there's a bleed there. On the Thursday, on the Thursday afternoon, I got a call from Specsavers. I then on Friday went into Specsavers and by Tuesday I was having an, upper, um, an, an injection. And when you go to the hospital, it's everybody who's having injections now. And what it is, is they're using ILEA which actually people should know lasts longer than Lucentis. Um, they start off by doing it monthly and then it'll go to six weeks, eight weeks, three months. You know, they, they follow it through like that with ILEA, but it's the optician and um, they're, they're doing most of the sort of preliminary work now. Yeah, that, they, they, yeah, that's right. We really do need opticians to do this for us because there, there aren't enough doctors and nurses to go around, are there? So we really do need to look at how we can make use of that marvellous workforce in the... Uh, well, when I used to go, at the very beginning, there used to be 90 patients for an afternoon clinic in the eye department. Now you go and there's perhaps six people in there, but they're all having injections. Mm -hmm. There are days when people, they're sent and uh, the consultant will see them and will die, will say, yes, you've got macula, you know, but um, yeah. So tell me now. The ECLO should be the one who's giving out all the information. And if people are going to the hospital and being diagnosed and they're not given any information, phone the ECLO because she has got, she's got macular leaflets. She's got all the connections and they, she should be there 
helping people to accept it, which in my day, they weren't around, but now, of course, they are. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're very, very useful. Pat? Excuse me, the, the ECLO in, in our hospital has all the leaflets and gives loads of information, but yeah. unfortunately the ECLO's room or office is two wards away from where the eye clinic is. Oh no, I was just... Which, you know, is no help whatsoever. There mm. are posters up and, and, and there's no staff directing them to the ECLO usually. The ECLO has yeah, to so, try and, and find things out from the consultant. They're not consult easily accessible and they're not very helpful. I don't, hope we haven't lost Pat there. So a, a question has just come into the chat. Does registering as partially cited affect your a bit validity to ride a mobility scooter legally? Now, that is a very good question. Does anybody know the answer know. to that? I don't know that. No, I have no I idea. I'm running people over. No. No. <laughs> no. no. Okay. I guess if you don't um, have to have a no, license to have a mobility scooter. Off. Anyway, okay, and um, uh, somebody's asked what's an echo, it's not an echo, sorry, it's my diction, it's echo. an echo, an echo. eye clinic liaison officer, uh, and these are uh, people in eye clinics who are um, perhaps in probably the NHS or perhaps by a cha another charity, and they're there to uh, help navigate, help people navigate the, the diagnosis and understand and signpost them to other sources of support and so on. So an eye clinic liaison officer in many clinics, eye clinics, uh, but not in all. So if you haven't come across one, I'm very sorry, they are very useful where they, where they, uh, where they can be found. So your top tips, everybody, then, as we just come to a close. Now, Louise, I know that you've got a book out coming out soon, haven't you? Tell me about your book. <laughs> Yes, I have. It's very exciting. Um, so I am part of a book collaboration with 12 other amazing ladies and we have all written a chapter. It's called Letters to My Teenage Self, Volume 2, and it will be out at the beginning of July in print and on Kindle. So my chapter was all about my diagnosis and all of the emotions that I went through how I felt, how I coped, how I navigated the world, and then kind of bringing it up to kind of where I am now and sort of retrospectively looking back that whilst at the time, you know, it did seem very gloomy that I was being told, you know, you'll never drive, you can never do this, you can never do that. Actually, life is what you make it and you have that choice and that opportunity. So you can either dwell on sight loss and how awful things are, and how unfair life is and you know why me or you can choose to think right okay this is what I've got I'll just have to do things differently and I'll go about things in a different way so with regards to sport you know if there's something that you love but you're struggling to do it explore experiment see what else is out there locally have a look online if you are able to get somebody to help you and just see what else is out there and give it a try because you might find something else which is more accessible for you that you can still enjoy and still love so for me I used to be very sporty and I talk about this in my chapter and um, now I do yoga and I love it and I love going for walks with Michael Caine of course um, so life can change but it doesn't hold you back so just go out there and grab those opportunities Thank you very much. I've got some problems with my sound at my end, but thank you very much indeed for that. So we're coming to the to the end. Pat, um, Kate and Louise, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. It's been so interesting to hear your stories and incredibly helpful to all the people on the call, um, who, 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 many of whom are listening to some of this for the first time, and it will be so helpful and illuminating for them. Um, thank you very much indeed. We will be back next Welcome. month with another My Macula and Me um, uh, the same sort of Tuesday, seven o'clock. Uh, look out for the notices about what we'll be talking about at that time. But in the meantime, Pat, Louise, Kate, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. It's been a joy to hear your, uh, your, your expertise. Uh, and thank you for sharing that with all of us. I'm very grateful. Thank you to everybody who joined the call today uh, as well. I hope that you found that an interesting session and we'll be back at the same time next month. In the meantime, thank you again and have a lovely evening. Thank you.